of our seven week fall series. And this year we're working with a new book by an author that I think we're all familiar with. The new book is called Resilient, How to Grow an Unshakable Core of Calm, Strength, and Happiness. And the author is Rick Hansen, who wrote another well-known book called Buddha's Brain that we worked with back in 2011. And in some respects, this book, Resilient, um, is a follow-up. It's, it's drawing on the latest research in the fields of psychology and neuroscience that have happened since Buddha's Brain was published. And this is a subject that is really, really right up our alley in unity, because for over a hundred years we've been emphasizing the importance of mind, the importance of, of human thought. And of course for over 2,300 some odd years before that, the Buddha was trying to do the same thing, but it's only in the past 20 years or so that we've made some great strides in, in neuroscience, which is telling us some interesting and above all useful things about what it is that makes us think the way we think and do the things that we do. So, this is the basic premise of the book, which I didn't find in the book, incidentally. I found it on his website, but it really, it sums up the book better than anything I found in the book so far. Maybe it's there, hiding someplace, but here's what he says. You can use your mind to change your brain, to change your mind, to benefit yourself and other beings. That's real simple. That is one entire book summed up in that little phrase up there. And, and in particular, he's focusing on using the mind to change the brain, to change the mind, in order to grow the quality of resilience. And that's a, that's a word that uh, comes from the Latin language, which literally means to bounce back, to bounce back or to spring back, and this is why he thinks that resilience is such an important quality. Mental resources like determination, self-worth, and kindness are what make us resilient, able to cope with adversity and push through challenges in the pursuit of opportunities. Resilience helps us recover from loss and trauma and offers much more than that. True resilience fosters well-being, an underlying sense of happiness, love, and peace. Remarkably, as you internalize experiences of well-being, that builds inner strength, which in turn makes you more resilient. Well-being and resilience promote each other in an upward spiral. That sounds great. About the only criticism I might offer is that it seems a little bit self-centered maybe, all about me and my well-being, and isn't that really where it has to start? How can, I be of, how can I be in any position to make a difference in the world if I lack the resilience to, to bounce back from failure or to bounce back from, from trauma that might be lurking in my past? or to simply deal with the slings and the arrows of outrageous fortune that come in our rapidly changing world every single day, it seems. You know, the, the, the fact is that we have to learn how to develop inner strength and meet our own needs so we can be in a better position to help others, right? It's like they say when you're flying. You've all heard it, right? In case of a sudden loss of cabin pressure, what are you supposed to do with those masks that drop down? Put your own, put your own on first, then look for anyone who might need help because you can't do much good for anyone else if you're sitting there passed out in your seat because you were trying to help other people and not putting your own mask on. That's how it works. Before you can be a caregiver, before you can be a caregiver, you have to learn the skills of self-care or you will burn out. So today, the topic is compassion because the path to resilience begins with Compassion, and this is a word that I kind of like to use interchangeably for the word love in most circumstances. I think it's a word that we need in our vocabulary to add some depth, to add some, some, some additional meaning to this very, very limited love language that we have in the English-speaking world. 
So here's a, a simple definition of compassion that they use in the book. Compassion is the recognition of pain with the desire to relieve it. There you go. The recognition of pain with the desire to relieve it. Compassion is our response to suffering in the world. And at the very least, it means that we have to look and see it. Because so often, we would rather look the other way or close our eyes or pretend that some of those things don't exist. You know, they've, they've, they've done studies using devices that measure people's brain activity. And when they ask subjects to, to think about compassion, they noticed that the motor planning areas of the brain would, would light up, which indicates that as they thought about compassion, their bodies were getting ready for action getting the muscles ready for a signal. So compassion isn't just some passive reaction or feeling. It becomes a call to action where that's possible. So chapter one that we're working with today focuses on compassion that's directed inward towards ourselves. And then later on in the series, we're going to look at ways to take that outward, but it has to start within. So here's how it works. He says that, when we treat others with respect and caring, the best in them usually comes out. Much the same would happen if we could treat ourselves the same way. Yet, most of us are a better friend to others than we are to ourselves. We take care about their pain, see positive qualities in them, and treat them fairly and kindly. But what kind of friend are you to yourself? Many people are tough on themselves, critical, second-guessing, self-doubting, tearing down rather than building up. Something else I get out of that quote. If I find myself being tough on others, critical, second-guessing, doubting, tearing down rather than building up, that's a warning sign telling me to take a look at how I treat myself. You know, there are ways to be constructive without tearing down. We can criticize with kindness, we can question without being cynical, and the way we treat others is in large measure a reflection of how we instinctively treat ourselves. So if there's a disconnect, it might be a good idea to start right here with how we treat ourselves. As Jesus would say, start with the log in your own eye instead of by pointing out the sawdust speck in your neighbor's eye. And I might add, do it with kindness and compassion in both cases. So throughout this uh, series, there are going to be some key ideas and themes that we're going to hear repeated, starting with this very interesting word, Neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity is the ability of the brain to take passing experiences and turn them into something more permanent by establishing a neural network. It creates a circuit that we can strengthen by repeated stimulation. This is something that already goes on in the brain at the subconscious level. We may not be aware of it, but it happens. Repeated experiences have a lasting effect on the brain. They tend to get wired in place. And would anyone care to guess what kind of experiences have the greatest effect, negative or positive? Negative. Unfortunately, negative. Yes, you've heard this one before. Negative ones make the most lasting impressions. Neuroscience is discovering that, that memory has what they call a negative bias which is similar to something we worked on earlier this year when we were looking at Steven Pinker's book, Enlightenment Now. We learned that uh, people are convinced that things are getting worse instead of better because there's a negative bias in the media and we have an innate tendency towards hanging on to the negative stuff. So there's a metaphor that Rick Hansen likes to use, uh, and this is from Buddha's brain primarily. He says that the, uh, the negative stuff sticks to your brain like stuff sticks to Velcro, and the positive stuff tends to slide right out like an egg in a Teflon pan. 
So um, the negative stuff is Velcro and the positive stuff is like Teflon, which means that the pile of bad stuff or negative stuff is always growing faster than the good stuff. Which is not to say that negative experiences are worthless, because that's how we learn, right? We can learn from them if we can bring them out into the open. But as a practical matter, as a practical matter, is there anyone here today that thinks they're not getting enough negative experiences lodged in their subconscious? Anybody <laughs> craving more negative stuff? You know, that's generally not the case, right? So that's the bad news. The negative stuff is there. It's hard to get rid of. It likes to stick around. But the good news is neuroplasticity. Back to that word, neuroplasticity. You see the word plastic in there? Plastic is a substance that's flexible. It can be reshaped, it can conform to whatever you want it to conform to. So we're literally rewiring or reshaping neural pathways. And it involves a, a two-step process. Uh, he says, first, we need to experience what we want to grow, such as feeling grateful, loved, confident, compassionate. Second, and critically important, we must convert that passing experience into lasting change in our nervous system. Otherwise, there is no healing, no growth, no learning. So step one, having the experience. Two ways we can go about that. We can focus on the passing experiences that are going on right now in the present moment, or the other way is that we can recall a time from the past when we had that experience use the imagination to recreate it and then to relive it as a present experience. That's a good alternative because many, many times as we go about our daily activities, we can't simply stop and drop everything and contemplate a particular experience that we might be having. Driving comes to mind. Um, don't do that while you're driving or giving a talk. I could all of a sudden space out up here and start you know, playing with an experience. That's, that's not good. We don't want to do that. So it's nice to be able to sit back and, and probe our memory banks and bring something from the past to the present and use that as an experience. And uh, one of the practices we're going to talk about next week is mindfulness, which comes in really handy for being able to say, take a passing experience, notice it, and then tuck it away for later consideration. A lot of times stuff happens in our lives and we don't note it, we rarely remember it, or if we do remember it, we think, well, how can I have missed that? So mindfulness helps us to be able to take those passing experiences and, uh, and, and, and put them away for later consideration. Otherwise, again, the next best thing we can do is to call something to mind from the past. And it's a, it's a practice that he gives us in the book, which was the subject of the uh, meditation that Karen led this morning. We actually want to try to recreate the experience almost as if we were living it again. And then we want to stay with it for whatever time is comfortable or, or available. And then we want to repeat that entire process because, again, that's, that's how it gets hardwired. In fact, that's one of the fundamental rules of neuroplasticity. Neurons that fire together wire together. Neurons that fire together, wire together. That's known, as, that's known as Hebb's rule, based on the work of Donald Hebb, who was a Canadian neuropsychologist who made that discovery back in 1949. This was kind of at the very beginnings of the field of, uh, of neuroscience. And it requires repetition. To get that, that wiring effect, it requires repetition. And uh, again, uh, next week during the section on mindfulness and learning, we're going to look at a more in-depth process to do this repetitively, to go from the experience uh, to actually embedding it uh, um, in these neural pathways. But for this week, we're simply going to focus on finding an experience and staying with it. That's how it has to start. And in fact, this is really an excellent practice to focus on for the rest of the week. Um, and since we're talking about compassion again in the context of, of self-care, we're going to be using the exercise that you can find starting on page 15 in the book. And don't worry, again, if you don't have the book, because it's the same meditation that Karen led today, which you can get on a CD of uh, this service if you want to pick one up. Or um, you can simply tune into our website 
And uh, the meditation and the talk should be online for you to listen to and download probably tomorrow morning. Um, and, and incidentally, we don't always upload the meditation portion uh, to the website, uh, but for this series, we're going to be trying to do that for each week because uh, each week, each chapter has a particular exercise to work with to deepen the practice. So check the website or get a CD if that works better for you and, uh, and use the meditation as your practice for this week. And uh, each week I'm going to try to give some homework like that and uh, make sure we have the resources to support that because that's what this series is all about, taking it, taking it deeper. So when you heard that meditation that Karen led this morning, uh, some of you who might be familiar with Buddhism, you might have recognized it. It's, uh, it's very similar to uh, what the Buddhists call a metta meditation. It's a process that comes from the Buddha, Buddhist metta sutta, uh, which sets forth what they call the, uh, the uh, Brahma Viharas, or the four sublime attitudes in Buddhism. The four sublime attitudes are loving kindness, compassion, empathetic joy, and equanimity. So this practice focuses on the first two. So with that, I'm going to uh, conclude this morning with a passage from the book that's based on this Tibetan proverb, which says that if you take care of the minutes, the years will take care of themselves. What's the most important minute in life? I think it's the next one. There is nothing we can do about the past, and we have limited influence over the hours and days to come. But the next minute, minute after minute after minute, is always full of possibility. Are there opportunities to be on your own side, bringing caring to your pain, accept yourself, and enjoy what you can? Is there something you could heal something you could learn. Minute by minute, step by step, strength after strength, you can always grow more of the good inside yourself, for your own sake and the sake of others as well. That's all for today. Hope to see you all next week in pink for <laughs> learning and mindfulness. <laughs>